for pieces like that. But it's really, a lot of it is really based in science and trying to understand enough of the science so that you can be inspired to behave differently yourself and look at things in a different way. That's it. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, Bentley, would you be willing to go next? Are you there? No. All right, Nancy. You're on mute. Been a lifetime very connected to words. I'm a philosopher by training. And I see myself as an applied philosopher in the world, very interested in bureaucracies and strategies and tactics. And I'm incredibly excited because I have up a, a brand new website I'm not sharing with very many people. It as yet has little actual content. It's meant to be a structure where I can drop in in orderly fashion a lot of information on strategies and tactics, different perspectives, different questions. Um, if we get a chance today, maybe we can find like literally less than five minutes to glance at it. I would be thrilled if we did that. And there's not enough content there to take more than five minutes anyhow, but I'm looking for just kind of the visual and impact of the images and words that I've got up so far. Um, the other thing is, I've been kind of divvying up our, it helps me to try to track all the things that are happening by or, organizing them. That's the philosophic bent, I guess. And I'm finding it helpful to distinguish what I'm calling to connect, to resist, to protect, to reconnect, and to redesign. And I see efforts in these five areas and all going on in my extremely progressive, extremely self-righteous, arrogant, and condescending community of Santa Cruz. Um, and there's a small percent of people here who are starting to get genuinely interested in trying to bridge the chasm. And I'm very, very interested in that. And I'll put out a question. My sense is if we can get underneath, it's kind of the getting to yes, or NBC stuff, but if we can get underneath the positions and the conflicts down to the underlying challenges that we are all equally challenged by. It's not like we're coming into a conversation with each other already having the answers, but rather coming in struggling with, for example, if the jobs go away, what do we live on? How do we make a living? It seems to me that is a deep, scary question that we avoid by fighting with each other. Um, but if we can somehow get down to that, we're down to the point where we may be having substantive conversations out of our real experiences, out of which we might start discovering some shared sense of what the solutions might be and actions we could actually cooperate on. So I'll just put that out there as a point of departure in our thinking, because I'm really curious what that might look like. And I'm, I'm done. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. <clears throat> Dee, would you be willing to go next? Sure. I um, have a picture here of things that are important in my life right now. See if you can see it. Looks very abstract. Oh, there, there are musicians, maybe? No, I can barely see it. How about... That could be brought up on our screen, on a this share one. screen, if you want, maybe. It's, it's the Super Bowl, y'all. Ah, it's the Patriots the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I had one comment, one observation I wanted to make after last month's chat, and that is I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, when you go to the gym, all the people there seem to be not needing to be there. And uh, when you're not at the gym, the people, those are the people who seem like they need to be there. And I kind of get that feeling here, too. Uh, it's not the folks here who... 
really need to be hearing and having these conversations. I think you all are open and interested and, and curious and, and want to learn. It's so anyway, just wanted to mention that. Yeah. It's one of our ongoing issues. And let's let's make sure we reserve some time at the end to really get into that. How do we attract more people? We really need to be here. All right, David, would you like to go next? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'm in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in a training program for psychologists, and my interests are in convening dialogues across people who have ideological differences, uh, both in my university context and community. And I'm struggling right now with how to connect with people of more conservative persuasions and to find a language and a motivation that would interest them uh, in uh, that type of conversation. I've already been advised not to use the word dialogue, to use words like listening. And there's an NCDD resource from years ago that talks about uh, finding conservative partners and not focusing on uh, common goals or underlying uh, commonalities. So I'm struggling uh, both to connect with students uh, and others on my campus and with people in my community to uh, experiment with that. Because I, I find that, uh, similarly to what Stephen just said, I find myself in an echo chamber of people who are um, liberal activist types and the dominant emotions that they have right now are um, fear and rage. And um, a few of them are interested in dialogue, but more of them are interested in venting right now, venting and activism. So there's, I think, issues with joining dialogue uh, from those um, folks. And uh, so who, 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 if anyone is interested in uh, dialogue right now is uh, sort of w where I'm at at times here, but I'm still very fascinated with it. Uh, I'm reading Jonathan Hates the Righteous Mind, which we talked about in our last uh, call, and it's you know really um, a very interesting read about how um, rationality is a small rider atop a very large elephant of uh, our emotions. So that's yeah. my intro for today. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, Dennis, you just jumped on. Um, we are just simply telling each other where we are, a little bit about us and our interest in this group. And if you have any current juicy thoughts or questions you'd like to enter, that's what oh, we're doing on our own. One more thing, excuse me. Um, I have to, uh, to leave after one hour, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, we won't hold it against you, we promise, but we'll be take, it is being recorded so you can come on and listen. All right, Dennis, take it away. Hello, uh, Dennis Boyer here. I live in southwest Wisconsin in a rural area, but I do a lot of my public discussion work uh, throughout the upper Midwest. I uh, have been specializing the last uh, few years in uh, democratic uh, process in policymaking, have uh, focused uh, even more on uh, democratic practice and process about uh, electoral strategies and uh, participatory methods uh, in in the public sector. And uh, I, I certainly have seen a change in tone uh, post-election. And as others have noted, there's a much more of a sense of, of uh, anger and grieving uh, since then. But I, I have been uh, working with some groups that are moving past that uh, to varying degrees uh, and varying degrees of success. So I'm looking to uh, uh, learn more about what's happening around the country and these type of things. I, uh, I, I am a neutral. Uh, I've come from a background in conflict resolution, even though I'm certainly uh, have my own opinions and would be generally viewed on the progressive side of, of things. But I have a, a long tradition of working uh, with the, at least economic conservatives towards solutions. I've had less success in the social conservative area, but I frequently, in my participatory efforts, have uh, libertarians. I, I have a, a lot of uh, open doors with them, uh, both of the uh, genuine libertarian type and the kind of libertarian 
uh, free market types within the Republican sector as well. So those are some of the things I, uh, I do and uh, just hoping to learn some more about what's happening elsewhere. We've had, we have a different context here, especially in Wisconsin, where we've really been embattled and divisive for quite some time. We've had, uh, we had a huge blow up uh, nearly uh, six, seven years ago. And essentially, we've been in low intensity civil war here ever since. Wow. That would be interesting to explore at some point. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Bentley, would you like to go next? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Bentley Davis. Um, <clears throat> I have a website, settleit.org. I'm a software developer is my core. Um, but for the last four or five years, I've been focusing my efforts on how I can make the world a better place. And that all comes down to communication and dialogue uh, as the core of everything else. Every, all my other ideas depend upon being able to get people to understand um, the world they're in and everything. So I'm also hopefully getting a certification in dialogue and deliberation, actually dealing with people not using technology. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but, um, and, it, and, uh, to what kind of David said about, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in a liberal echo chamber and I want to find a way to communicate better with the conservative and the Republican and the different groups that are out there and some of the, and I do know a couple libertarians and stuff. So finding a common, uh, language that speaks to them is something I'm very, uh, interested in and um, something I'm going to be diving into in my blog is about uh, my exploration of how to uh, communicate with a lot of stuff I've learned over NCDD over the years um, and then and, and my own research on, on how to communicate and then at some point using my technology skills to um, scale it out. So that's what I'm doing. Great. Wow. Very cool. So Philip, are you on? We don't see you. Not sure where he is, so maybe we'll come back to him. I'll go ahead and just check in. Um, well, I'm really noticing amazing energy. I mean, I've been with a lot of people these last, well, this last month, uh, where all the anger and the rage and all that is coming out. I just formed a face-to-face um, -face group in my artist community called the Two Back uh, Community Forum, and that's going gangbusters. And again, we have a similar problem. We're not attracting very many conservative people, but I have a strategy that I'm gonna to use to try for, it's, and it's a weekly group, so I can hopefully get uh, more conservatives in more quickly. There's a, a well-heeled country club close to where I live, and so since I'm a social member of that club, I've decided to put my poster over there. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I don't know that it's gonna work. Uh, and I would actually uh, want some tips. Hopefully Steve could give us some tips. In fact, you already gave me one this weekend for how to motivate conservatives into this conversation. But I'm just, I'm actually thinking in some way, Nancy, you said this to me also that over the weekend, that in some, in some ways we'll thank Trump someday <laughs> for getting us Democrats, us liberals, progressives, um, to be more active and to really you know, try more to bring a fuller spectrum of people into conversation. So I'm, I'm feeling at least right now hopeful that we can do it. And I'm uh, really looking forward to tonight's uh, kickoff with, uh, with Scott and Steven. So let's see, Philip just kind of went away. So I guess we'll just move on. Uh, did you Scott or did you Steve want to start first? I can't remember. Okay, it's looking like Scott's going to start us off. So we're, we're going to listen to them for a few minutes, uh, talking about the liberal and the conservative, kind of unpacking the term around empathy, compassion, and um, I'm sure other concepts will come up, and then we'll, we'll unpack it some more in dialogue. Scott, we're not hearing you for some reason. No, you're on mute. There, there I am. we go. My portion has to do with uh, mostly about personality, and I'm going to take about 10 minutes to talk, uh, just five minutes or so about personality issues in general, and then, uh, and then talk about a sort of special uh, implication as a result of that, that, that kind of kicks our butts when we're dealing with conservatives. Um, so personality is how human beings express themselves. It's how they express their selves. It's 
it's what we do. Everything that we do really can be handled or thought of as within the realm of personality. The big five has been broken down into 10, two in different pieces. Compassion, and we're, gonna, we're just gonna talk about empathy and compassion as the same thing. Um, there's been some recent work that kind of separates the two, but basic idea is that you feel what other people feel, you experience that, and then also you have an emotional connection as a result of that. So it's not just understanding where they're coming from, but it's also an emoting process. Now it turns out that compassion is one of the 10 aspects of personality traits that liberals are stronger in than conservatives. And when you talk about compassion in the sense that it's defined in scientific terms, you're talking about a feeling. And that's important. Um, the reason why that's important is because left-wing people tend to derive a lot of their inspiration in life from their right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere of, their, of our brains is really, really oriented much more around emotions than the left brain. The left brain doesn't have a whole lot of use for, for at least, I shouldn't say all emotions, some emotions are actually uh, a big deal in the left hemisphere, but usually they're the simpler ones and they're the happier ones. Um, the more complex ones and the ones that are darker are a, are a right hemisphere function. And that's where empathy comes in a lot. So. So that feeling is something that we really experience as liberals, um, more so than, than conservatives do. Again, in this sort of narrow event, so Steve will talk about another angle that I think is a great compliment to this, but, but that, that difference is really important. It's one of the reasons why um, this right hemispheric emotion orientation means that we pour out in the streets by the millions to get things done because we are driven more by our emotions than the right. And if you talk to people on the right about what's been happening the last two weeks and us pouring out on the streets, they see it as completely and utterly ineffectual, stupid, immature, these kinds of things. But it's, it really comes down to an inherited personality difference that makes us understand how that can be important for us to stick together, to gain, gain emphasis on things, to have some focus from a PR standpoint, and also to be able to get get jazzed enough to focus on something specific afterwards, you know, like you're beginning a process. So it all makes sense to us. So, and empathy is also fueled by our overall much higher openness um, because openness is a way for us to enable empathy, right? It's a way for us to, to look into someone else and then trigger emotion that way. And that's, that's a, a byword that we have as liberals. So what, what, I, what I want you to get out of that then is that we are fundamentally built different from an empathy standpoint. Now, and Steve, Steve will get into this a little bit, but I'll, I'll just kind of intro it a little bit, I think. <clears throat> when, when you're driven by emotions, you moralize the emotional experience. You highlight it, you make sure it's really important. And dragging in a bunch of side issues for a liberal can feel immoral when you've got an obvious problem in front of you, like take, take police brutality. It's a good example where we, we see a victim and that, that's what we see, we empathize with them we watch what appears to be torture and it infuriates us. And, and in a large way, that's kind of the beginning and the end of the story, all right? What happens with conservatives instead, not only will they necessarily, not necessarily have empathy with the same person, because they might have empathy with the police in that specific situation for whatever reason. But what we need to understand about their version of empathy is that, yeah, statistically, they, they feel a little bit less. But I think that that's really overemphasized. In fact, you, you read that all the time, that they're greedy, careless, you know, unfeeling. And this is, this is the second most important annoying thing that conservatives uh, hear from us that they talk about. They, they know that they're compassionate and that that difference, whatever it is between us and them, it's not a particularly big difference. And that's their, their point. Now, from a feeling standpoint, 
the ironic component of it, and there's a lot of ironies, we should always think in terms of ironies and left versus right stuff. But the irony here is that you may end up, if you use your brain and you get factual and you get unemotional and a little bit of distance from an emotional intense re result from something, you may be able to loop in facts and other dimensions to the situation that make a lot of sense so that you can do effective compassion, right? So that you can enact good things as a result of compassion. So I, I use the term empirical compassion or, or em, empiric, empirical empathy because I want to emphasize that coming out of John Haidt's work is a good example of this where where liberals have this very strong emotional reaction around care, which is driven by empathy. And that's our main big button. I've always called myself a monopole from a moral standpoint. You know, that's, that's what drives me, okay? Well, the classic difference that Haidt covers a lot in, in his Righteous Mind book is the idea that conservatives systematically bring in other factors, loyalty, sacredness, respect for authority, and sometimes even fairness and freedom, and other ones too that they haven't necessarily sussed out in that particular theory. But the idea is that we're dragging in other elements to the problem. Recently, a professor out of Stony Brook University was able to ascertain using a really, really clever study, he was able to show that empathy was peaked for, for conservatives, and then over time, and we're talking seconds here, over time, what happens is their, their empathy goes down because what they're doing is they're dragging in other elements that take that, that notion of empathy and kind of bring it down because they've got these other things that they have to consider. In the case of police brutality, for instance, they, they all have some empathy for somebody who's getting beat up, but they're also asking questions like, you know, why is he getting beat up? Did, did he beat somebody up before that? Um, you know, what, what else is involved in this picture? Why is this happening? You know, what else could the police do? Um, these kinds of questions that come in all the time on the side. So, so my main point, I'll just close with this, is that you've got a situation where we've got half of us that are driven really, really strongly by a, a sort of a more pure and emotional response. And then you've got half of us that have the majority of that from a statistical standpoint, some are much higher, some are lower, but from a statistical standpoint, they've got, you know, a decent feeling response, but then their own makeup being more left brain oriented is they're going to drag in elements to the problem that liberals might not consider. And as they do that, because the emotional response is so sacred to us, we feel like they're trying to change the subject. We feel like they're being disingenuous oftentimes, that they're trying to shunt aside things that are important. We, we might even feel like they're manipulating the situation to drag in things that don't matter and that they're being disingenuous that way. So that's a common pattern in these, uh, these sort of compassion wars, what I think of them as. Again, this is the second most important, the first most important thing that they uh, that they complain about is that we think we're so goddamn smart. You know, that we hear all the time. But the second is they really resent the notion of being told that they're not compassionate. And I think this is, this is kind of the mechanism that we need to keep in mind around that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. That was sure. excellent. All right. So our conservative, Steve, what would you say from a conservative point of view? Um, yeah, I hope you don't mind that I take a lot more time than Scott did. I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I wrote down sort of the story that I'd like to tell. Um, but before I get into that, one reaction I have, if you want tips on how to get more conservatives involved, stop telling them they're less compassionate and stop telling them they're less open. 
because I will argue that not only are those things not true, that in fact the opposite is true. So what I want to say here is, is that I'm not a social scientist, I'm not an academic, I've not studied neurology. Everything I say is just my own personal opinion or interpretation. I don't even pretend to speak to a, for all conservatives. I only speak for me. And I think some of the things that I think and believe, even about conservatives, are not going to fit the, the standard model of, of how we like to think of them. Um, what I want to stick to is a main theme of my comments from last month, which is that we humans tend to demonize that which we do not understand, and we don't understand a whole hell of a lot about ourselves, and especially about, our, about conservatives. As a conservative, I feel like in, in American culture today, I'm I'm guilty until proven innocent. It it's always feels like an uphill battle in, in talking with um, liberals, or at least in the way I feel conservatives are represented in the media, on TV, and and such. It's from my perspective, we are consistently and perpetually characterized as something we're not, and then demonized for being that something. And it's just infuriating. And to me, this looks like a failure of empathy on the part of the people who are mischaracterizing us. Uh, and I think some relatively minor tweaks to K through 12 public school curricula would go a long, long way toward decreasing some of the worst symptoms of, of partisanship. So I want to use empathy, um, a, a case in point uh, about how I think conservatives are misrepresented is any suggestion that they have less empathy or sympathy or compassion than liberals do. Uh, it, it, it's simply not, not true. Um, you know, and as, for example, as an owner and operator of a conservative brain, and as a person who lives inside the world, it creates for me and as a guy who literally gets teary-eyed at Hallmark TV commercials and is happy that movie theaters are dark so people around me don't see me wiping my eyes at the emotional uh, parts, and who has had his own share, uh, as, as everyone does, who lives, uh, has his own hair, had his own share of hard times, heartache, and so forth. I say that, you know, anyone who, who believes that conservatives have less empathy or compassion or sympathy than liberals is just wrong. They just don't understand uh, conservatives. So getting to the unpacking of what all this means, last month we talked about bubbles. Larry observed um, that everybody lives in their own bubble, and to an extent that's true, but I think it's also the true is society is filled with bubbles, for example, and, and bubbles within bubbles, the congregation of a church, for example, or the members of a local Elks Club or bubbles that exist within the larger bubble of the town and the town within the state and so on. And uh, one of the points I want to make here is that American popular culture is itself sort of a super bubble, Western culture, if you will, within which all the other bubbles including liberalism and conservatism, Republicans and Democrats, swim like schools of fish in a common sea. Uh, and so I want to really focus on the bubble first because that provides the context uh, within which we talk about uh, uh, empathy. And what I want to say is never underestimate the power of the bubble or the bubbles in general to influence how we perceive and react to the social world. Uh, I want to read to you parts of the Mike Romano story from the book Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, and after that, I want to unpack the relationship between this and empathy. Mike Romano was born in 1950 and raised in Milwaukee. Uh, the youngest of four brothers. He had a temper in high school. Uh, he got into a fight and threw a guy through a window. Afraid of what would happen in court, he enlisted in the army. 
he figured he was going to be drafted anyway, so and the court let him go. A few months after he arrived in, in Vietnam, he was injured and taken to a hospital. That was where he first tried opium. He quickly became hooked, like so many others around him. Even when he transferred to other hospitals, his supply wasn't interrupted. Romano's fall into drug use was a typical story during the Vietnam War. The White House was so troubled by reports of drug use among soldiers that it commissioned a study to investigate the scope of the problem. The results were disturbing. Before the war, the typical soldier had only casual experience with hard drugs and less than 1% had ever been addicted to narcotics. But once in Vietnam, almost half the soldiers tried narcotics and 20% became addicted. Demographics did not predict who would become drug users. Race and class were irrelevant. Government officials were terrified by what would happen when thousands of drug addicts began to return to America. Mike Romano was one of the people the officials were worried about. When he finally boarded his flight back to the United States in 1969, he headed home to Milwaukee, uh, smuggling a bag of uh, opium-laced joints with him. Uh, but then his life began to change. A week or two after his return, uh, he was driving with friends in town. He saw a girl he'd known in grade school. And he said, stop the car. He chased her, and, and they start dating. Um, uh, she caught on fairly quickly that he was an addict, and she put pressure on him to stop. He tried to quit a few times, uh, but each time he started to feel sick as withdrawal pains kicked in, and then he began using again. Meanwhile, he started work construction and house painting and temporary jobs. He started taking art classes. He got a job there designing promotional posters. After a few quit and release and relapse cycles, he began to wean himself off opium. And within about a month, he was clean. Mike Romano was one of the lucky ones. Or was he? White House researchers continued to investigate the drug problem among returning soldiers, and a puzzle started to emerge. Following up with the troops who returned home, investigators called them 8 to 12 weeks after their return to ask about their ongoing drug use. During the war, 50% had been casual users, 20% seriously addicted. Um, meaning that they had used drugs more than once a week for an extended period of time and experienced withdrawal symptoms if they tried to stop. But when investigators conducted follow-up, what they found blew their minds. Only 1% of the vets were still addicted to drugs. That was essentially the same rate as existed before the war. The feared drug-fueled catastrophe had not occurred. What had happened? People are incredibly sensitive to the environment and the culture, the bubble that we're talking about, to the norms and expectations of the communities they are in. We all want to wear the right clothes, say the right things, frequent the right places because we instinctively try to fit in with our peer group. Behavior is contagious, sometimes in surprising ways. Imagine that your job was to design an environment that would extinguish drug addiction. You could take drug addicted soldiers, drop them in the environment, and feel confident that the forces within it would act powerfully to help them beat their habits. Think of this environment as an anti drug theme park and assume that you can spend as much as you want to construct it. What would your theme park look like? It might look a whole lot like Mike Romano's neighborhood in Milwaukee. You'd want to surround the former soldiers with people who love them and care about them, who treat them as drug-free persons they once were. You'd give them interesting work to do, perhaps designing posters for rock bands so that their minds would be distracted from the joys of opium. You'd create well-publicized sanctions against drug use. You'd keep the drug economy underground, making the former soldiers sneak around to obtain news drugs. You'd make sure their girlfriends gave them a hard time about drugs, drug use. You'd set up social taboos so that the soldiers would feel derelict even pathetic if they kept using. You'd remove the contagious drug-using behavior from the environment. No more addicted soldiers around and replace it with contagious drug-free behavior. And you would provide a rich environmental cues, sites, songs, food, clothes, homes that remind the former soldiers of their pre-war drug-free identities. The Milwaukee Theme Park. That's exactly why Mike Romano became a former addict. When Romano located to Milwaukee, his environment changed and the new environment changed him. 
So when we think about habits, when we think about bubbles, most of the time we're thinking about the bad ones, biting our fingernails, procrastinating, eating sweets. But of course, we also have plenty of good habits, jogging, praying, brushing our teeth. Why are habits so important? They are, in essence, behavioral autopilot. They allow lots of good behaviors to happen without the rider, heights rider and elephant, taking charge. Remember that the rider's self-control is exhaustible, so it's a huge plus if some positive things can happen free on autopilot. To change yourself or other people, you've got to change habits. And what we see with Romano is that his habits shifted when his environment shifted. So this whole story is just to say that these bubbles affect us very powerfully and more so than, than we think, okay? It's that the Mike Romano's story is not about Mike Romano's story, about Mike Romano, it's about the bubbles. Um, <clears throat> the social environment in which we are immersed are subtle yet powerful ways in which they shape not just our behaviors, but even our perceptions and thoughts about the world. So from that basic background about bubbles, I want to next move to something specific. I want to um, unpack this environment super bubble of Western pop culture that I started off talking about and how it shapes the, the conventional wisdom about empathy, some of which Scott just described. Uh, to do that, first I want to back up a couple steps and look, up, look at the bubble of academic social science. From there I'll build back up to, to the, the super bubble of American culture. Uh, it's well known that academic social science is the ivory soap of ideological bubbles. 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure, liberal. Uh, here, I want to read to you a couple of paragraphs from an article by Michael Shermer in Scientific American from March 1, 2016, entitled, Is Social Science Politically Biased? Quote, how does this political asymmetry corrupt social science? It begins with subjects that are studied and the descriptive language employed. Consider a 2003 paper by social psychologist John Jost, now at New York University, and his colleagues entitled, Political Conservatism as Motivated Social Cognition. Conservatives are described as having uncertainty avoidance, need for order, structure, and closure, as well as dogmatism and intolerance of ambiguity, as if these constitute a mental disease that, needs, that leads to distance to change and endorsement of inequality. Yet, one could just as easily characterize liberals as suffering from a host of equally malfunctioning cognitive states, a lack of moral compassion that leads to an inability to make clear ethical choices, a pathological fear of clarity that leads to indecisiveness, a naive belief that all people are equally talented, and a blind adherence in the teeth of contradictory evidence from behavior genetics, the culture and environment exclusively determine one's lot in life. Stephen, could I interrupt you for just a moment? It sounds as if you're mostly reading something and I'm trying to get very accurate capture. If it's already written down, I could stop doing that and then later get from you the written doc. Is that correct? Yes, it's written. I can. It's a Microsoft Beautiful. Word file. I can upload it or copy and paste it. However, so you like. good. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. I'm sorry I didn't say that in the beginning. Okay, that's okay. Um, if you if you could get to some of the things to, that would really help us contrast some of what Scott said, that would be very helpful to you. I I know. All right. Anybody familiar with Charles Murray's book Coming Apart and related articles knows that. Um, America has been self-segregating along ideological lines for decades. 78% of the counties that make up New York City voted for Hillary. Similar numbers are true in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, and so those left-wing ideological bubbles also happen to be the locations from which all three of the major muscle groups of American pop culture are owned and operated. Those industries, academia, media, and entertainment, those three industries are nearly as ideological pure as social science. The behavioral autopilot, the cruise control, the environment of American culture is nearly permanently entrenched in the left lane of the ideological highway. Um, so 
you know, do this little thought experiment with me. Imagine a world in which every single TV news outlet were like Fox News, ABC, NBC, PBS, NPR, CNN, and, and all the rest. Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, New York Times, and so forth, Sony Pictures, United Artists, all of them leaning as obviously and strongly to the right as academic social science leads left. Well, all the same symptoms of one-sided word use, implicit embedded values and interpretations, and also imagine nearly every product produced by those movies, TVs, prime time, the villain in every drama, the butt of every joke, uh, in late night host monologues and in the sitcoms is a, a left wing person. Imagine it's been this way for decades. And imagine that the past eight years, this attitude of smug condescension and barely disguised disgust has wafted from the White House and the Democratic Party and the nominee to replace the president. And imagine that one and only one news work that bucked the trend and saw things as you do was vilified and demonized by the, all the others as uneducated, small-minded, and bigoted. Uh, that wouldn't be a very nice bubble to live in. But that's exactly the bubble we do live in, except the other way around. It's entirely possible for liberals to grow up, live through adulthood, die of old age without ever encountering serious conservative thought. All they see is the caricature of conservatism that's fed to them through those industries, even John Haidt left conservative whisperer adds that admits that this his first encounter with serious conservative thought wasn't until until he reached the age of 40 and he was an ivy league educated psychologist and even then the only reason he did encounter conservative thought was because he actively sought it out himself because he was going to teach a course where he talked about it this is the culture that claims to pride itself on openness and inclusiveness and tolerance and compassion. It seems to be a non sequitur. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the story from David Foster Wallace about two young fish swimming along, a little fish comes the other way and says, how you doing guys, how's the water? And the two fish swim along for a while and say, what the hell is water? The immediate point of the fish story is that the obvious, the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this seems like a banal platitude, but the fact is that the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes, have life or death importance. So at this point, what does this have to do with empathy? Well, I'll tell you, everything. Behavioral autopilot of Western culture is just dead wrong about conservative empathy, compassion, and sympathy. The fact is that the American cultural theme park gets it completely backwards. It does this by defining empathy as the feeling, and importantly, the object of the feeling that is experienced by liberals. Empathy as it is experienced by conservatives is ruled out by definition. So the conclusion that liberals have more empathy than conservatives becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you're thinking, what is he talking about? Empathy is empathy. It's in the dictionary. There's nothing to be confused about. To that I would say, you just proved my point. You're the fish asking what's water. If you're familiar with the Star Trek then if you're, you're familiar with the concept of the prime directive, it's a single overriding guiding principle that influences, as it were, everything else. A radio commercial for a car dealer that I must have heard a hundred times before I moved to the DC area in the mid 1980s said, once you decide to be the best, all the other decisions are easy. I'm not saying that conservatives or liberals are internally driven to be the best at something. I mean, only that each seems to have a prime directive, a single moral sense that situates them in the world, provides them purpose, and makes all the other decisions easy. For liberals, it seems to me that the prime directive is the way they experience empathy, compassion, 
and sympathy. From where I sit, it seems to be something bigger, deeper, and more all-encompassing than merely just the moral foundations of care and fairness. It's a tendency to identify with and focus on the individual person in any situation. It's the feeling of heartbreak or sadness or sympathy one experiences when one sees or thinks of individuals who are suffering. It's a strong, natural, instinctive desire to reach out and calm and soothe and salve the wounds and protect those individuals. And by extension, all individuals who suffer. And by extension from that, all suffering. It is also a strong, sometimes passionate desire to make the cause of the suffering go away. Often the word empathy or the word compassion or the word sympathy is, a re is used to refer to what I'm calling the, the liberal prime directive, the liberal moral sense. Um, but what I'm seeing is this prime directive seems to be all of those things rolled up into one. But the words themselves have meanings that are separate from this all-encompassing prime directive. And I think this muddles or obfuscates what, what's really going on. The conservative prime directive includes all of those same things to the same degree. The real difference between liberals and conservatives, as I see it, is the object toward which those feelings are felt. For conservatives, the object of their empathy is not the individual. It is the family unit, which includes the individual. It is the cohesive whole. It is the neighborhood, the community. It is not just the bees, it is the bees and the hive, without which the bees cannot survive. The object of conservative empathy is the Milwaukee theme park, the behavioral autopilot, the moral fabric of our shared community. Conservatives are, quote, incredibly sensitive to the environment and the culture, to the norms and expectations of the communities they are in, end quote. The object of conservative empathy or compassion, or sympathy is not the individual, it's social capital. Even the definition of the word empathy is, is narrower than the way it's typically used. Um, it is not the feeling of sorrow or heartache one feels when one sees suffering in the others, nor is it the urge to reach out and help others to relieve the suffering. Empathy, rightly understood, is the ability to get inside the head of the other person. Here's how it's described by Wikipedia. The capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within the other person's beings or frame of reference is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. Empathy is seeing the, with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and with the feelings and heart of another. In the righteous mind, so in the righteous mind, Height describes a study in which he tests exactly this thing. He asks conservatives, liberals, and moderates to answer survey questions about social issues and then to answer more questions as I thought the other person would. In other words, he tested empathy. And here's how he summarizes his findings. The results were clear and consistent. Moderates and conservatives were most accurate in their predictions, whether they were pretending to be liberals or conservatives. Liberals were the least accurate, especially who described, those who described themselves as very, very liberal. The truth of the matter is that cognitively, emotionally, somatically, conservatives have more empathy than do liberals. And the more liberal one is, the less empathy one has. I go on from there. You probably don't want to hear it. I probably already talked too long. Um, but that gets to the main thrust of my perspective on things. I think uh, the narrative itself, the paradigm through which all of these discussions happen seems to be from the left. And half the battle for conservatives, 90% of the battle is to say, well, but there's more to it than that. It's, this is not what empathy really is to us. And when you say that liberals have more empathy or compassion or sympathy or are more open, um, we know from inside this heart and inside this brain that that's simply not the case. And it's just a constant uphill battle to try to 
have a conversation about these sorts of things with liberals when they know, as surely as they know grass is green and sky is blue, that they are more compassionate than, uh, than our conservatives. Okay, Steve, thank you. Um, I'm noticing we have someone on the line who I don't think we've, um, oh, they just left. <laughs> maybe that was, maybe that was David. So um, let's open it for conversation. Um, I know I have some questions, but uh, what questions do we have for Scott and for um, Steve? Nancy. I wanted to speak first because um, it's not quite a dark movie here, Stephen, but I'm moved to tears by what you said. It was so insightful, so thoughtful, so helpful to hear the amount of effort you put into it, the clarity. You made me realize how much of a conservative I am. <laughs> not that I doubted it because I am often struggling with some of the same issues you're talking about. Um, And I, I, I'm i going to go really deep, not this moment, but I'm going to be reflecting very, very deeply and heartfully on what you have said, because I think you have been able to catch something that we could really work with in building the bridges. Um, you've not only brought a basis for our being able to reconnect. But part of the beauty of it, there's a wholeness in the vision of what we need together that comes through in what you've said. So that our coming together and healing not only enables us to rebuild the relationships and even the political solidarity that we need uh, to bring this country back on the right track, but a much deeper, more holistic, healthier vision of what it is we really need, because there's no question in my mind. The image I have is when you look at the fruits on the plants and you notice they're failing, then you notice they're failing, the individuals are failing because their families are failing, that is the plants are failing. Finally, you look at the soil and you realize, my God, the community is failing. Without healthy soil, without a healthy community, nothing else we try to do as human beings will work. And that has to be the basis for everything else. And you really brought that home beautifully. So I just want to thank you. And I don't at the moment have questions. Can I say just thank you very much for saying that. I, I, I was afraid a little bit that I was on too much of a rant and that I might be losing some of you, but if I got through to one, then I feel like I'm, uh, I can, I can sleep well tonight. Any other responses? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I wanted to thank uh, both Scott and Stephen, and uh, it helped me understand um, a bit more about the need to uh, consider this, the frames and scales of empathy. Uh, and I, much in what both of them said resonated for me, partly because I'm, I find myself outside of that binary world that often gets described in these discussions. I'm, I'm, if I were to describe myself, I'm neither a liberal nor a conservative. I'm something a lot more anomalous. I'm a left green who grew up rurally, I, I grew up on a farm, still live on a farm. And uh, I, so I, some of these things that are, you know, polarized uh, don't seem quite as polarized in my world. Uh, but uh, for, uh, for Stephen in particular, the way he described uh, those things about empathy, I sure, as he was saying, you know, I sure see it borne out because uh, my conservative neighbors, uh, even though they might not consider themselves conservative, I do, uh, they... Uh, they don't uh, exhibit any empathy gaps. If somebody's uh, barn blows away, they're over to help right away. Uh, so it's just, I think, a matter of uh, what the world, uh, you know, uh, how big their world is, 
and uh, what their experiences have been have, have been a large part of it. Uh, but when you get to conservative, I, I have a notion of uh, who liberals are. I have a less of a notion today uh, who conservatives are. When I was a younger man, I could listen to hours on end to someone like William F. Buckley, and wrongly or rightly, I, I thought, well, that's the voice of at least one big stream of conservatism. And it, uh, it, I could understand it, uh, didn't always agree with it. In fact, seldom agree with it, but it was, it was rational to me. Uh, and now in my area, those who call themselves conservative are often yelling at me <laughs> about things I never did or never supported. So I'm, I'm, I'm in fact, a, a lot of the people that I knew who were conservative feel like they're without a home today. So it's, it's, it's really difficult for me to sort out um, where things are. Uh, I wish I had a better notion of um, who conservatives are, but I would certainly uh, say uh, after hearing Stephen, I'm going to make sure that I don't uh, suggest a lack of empathy among conservatives. I don't think I do, but I'm going to be ever more mindful of it. So thanks. Yeah, I am. Um, Thank you. I one thing I heard. I, I guess I wanted to just clarify. I um, I really get why you went back into the bubbles we all live in, as we need to, because those do insulate us from each other's um, ideas of what a term might mean, and that's where we start to demonize. You know, that's why I think the bigger question, which I hope we have time for here, is how can we motivate people to come in from more diverse perspectives. I think part of that, the problem is they've had bad experiences and so they don't self-select to come in to what, might, what we might call, we liberals, a, a dialogue. But I also, I just wanted to clarify um, with you, Steve, uh, when it comes down to empathy then, what, one big difference I'm getting is that you look at it from a broader point of view, right? You look at it like, like you, you'll probably have the same level of empathy for the individual, but you don't look just at the individual, correct? You're looking at the family system, you're looking at the community. So you're looking at a lot of other things that perhaps we, you know, liberals wouldn't necessarily look at at first blush. Am I getting that right? I think that's right. I think one of the things that Scott has said uh, that I think Nancy tapped into in her comment is uh, Scott has noted to me that he thinks uh, liberals are often like, what, what do you call it, junior conservatives. I think the basic ingredients are all there. Um, they just aren't as prevalent in some areas. But if a conservative ever has the opportunity to to really dig in and have a conversation where the liberal actually hears them, I think we end up finding a lot more common ground than, than either of us thought we had to begin with. Also, I think some of the stuff Dennis said is, has to do with just our tribalism. You know, there are, I see it like layers of an onion and, and, and an awful lot of the layers are human things that are common to everyone, regardless of whether they're liberal and conservative. And, and some of that is we tend to retreat into our tribes and, and not really think and defend our tribe or its position, um, which prevents us from hearing what else is going on. And so that's why I like this particular group because that kind of all falls away and we're actually just talking to each other. And anyway, that's my response. So let me just clarify another thought I was having as you were talking. So uh, I think Scott brought up a, um, a situation where maybe it's police brutality or something. Yeah, let's, yeah, he did. And where we liberals might be a, 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 in a kind of a typical way, oh, you know, we, how horrible, this is awful. Uh, look at what happened. We're probably blaming the police. They overstepped, et cetera. So from a conservative point of view, I'm just trying this out on you, uh, Steve. From a conservative point of view, that response may seem almost um, naive or um, immature because we're not looking at the bigger picture. Am I getting it right? Am I interpreting your point of view right? Yes. And I think Scott did a good job of describing it, too. Um, and it, 
this book that I've that I may, I may have mentioned last month, but there's a new book out within just the past couple of months by Paul Bloom called Against Empathy. And that's basically his point, is that empathy, at least the way it's typically used, just is like a spotlight on a stage that zooms right in on the individual or right in on the victim and doesn't see the whole rest of the picture. Um, the terms I used were the bees in a hive. You know, it's very bee focused and it sort of ignores the hive. And sometimes Paul Bloom's point, and even there's another book called Pathological Altruism by Barbara Oakley. Um, her point, the, both of their point is when you focus on the bees, you can end up uh, doing damage to the hive, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, and you're right. So it's the bigger picture. Yes, sometimes I would say the conservative reaction is that liberals are naive uh, or not looking at the bigger picture. Um, in, in that particular instance, then, I think part of what get, might get in, into a play is that um, because I think liberals would tend to criticize um, conservatives around you know, rules or authority or, you know, way, ways we have set up society to, to function. And yet, from a conservative point of view, if I'm reading you right, um, these rules, these ways, these institutions we have are really meant to keep people safe. And so, so we tend to get into that clash in that way, right? Yes, yes, that's right. A part of this that I didn't read or a part that I uh, wrote in that longer paper. This is actually a condensed version of the long one I wrote, if you can believe that. Um, <clears throat> I talk about the moral foundations and, you know, the first three are supposedly the liberal ones and the later three conservatives add on to those. So conservatives have six. But I think even then there's a little bit of a, a, a misperception. For me personally, as a conservative, I experience the binding foundations, loyalty, authority, and sanctity as feelings of respect and even affection outwardly from me toward the other person or toward the object of, of that affection. I think this explains why conservatives react so strongly when they see a flag burning. You're harming a loved one when you're doing that. Yes, it's freedom of speech. Yes, it's protective. But if you do it, you're a jerk because you're harming a loved one. It, so the binding foundations are felt inwardly as feelings of respect toward other people. They are not felt as demands or rules that must be placed on other people in a, in a sort of an oppressive way. They're, they're just um, part of what's needed to, of, to make that moral fabric and to, and to make the healthy hive, which creates the healthy bees. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, it is that, it is that bigger picture. So it, it, from what I'm really getting is this very strong difference uh, between the individual and the collective. In other words, from a conservative's point of view, it's not just about the individual um, being beat up. I mean, sure, we, I'm sure a conservative would, would have feelings about that, but immediately they go to, well, what's the larger picture around this? You know, who was this person being beat up? How, you know, how did he get there in the first place, right? And what are the, the, the kind of the community aspects that led that to happen? That's right. I, I happen to be listening in the car to a, uh, a book by a favorite of all of you, Ann Coulter. And uh, uh, it's the book Mugged, and it's about racism. And one of these, an example, exactly what you're talking about is the Rodney King case. And the video that everybody saw was edited. Uh, and the part that was left out added context and also the whole story of everything that happened before the video even started led up to create a whole different understanding uh, of what actually happened, which led to the acquittal of the police officers. But the focus, the liberal focus on the individual, on Rodney King, prevented any of that from getting in. That and the, and the media just didn't show all of it either. Um, 
Very interesting. And so you're right. It's it's that bigger. You have to look at the whole community, look at the circumstances, look at what led up to it, and look at. I guess you would call it the greater good. It sounds like a very liberal thing. Collective is a word you use. That sounds like a very liberal thing, but it's it's that bigger picture that matters. In addition to individual, so conservatives would say yes and not. Yes, but. I got a couple of things I wanted to cover, if that's all right. Sure. Um, one, just to provide the other five of you with context here. Um, Steve and I have been going around and around for five years about this, and, and I think we, we pretty much see eye to eye on, on, on empathy and how this works. I, I am forced as a explication of he might call it liberal science, but I'll call it science. Um, that there's a group of, you know, traits, and one of them is called compassion, and we're higher in that particular trait. And there's a very specific definition for it. He doesn't like the definition. Um, I don't. I'm not sure I really like it either. But but the the point is to expand and change the definition in a useful way, and I think Steve has done that. Um, and that's what I was trying to do for you as well, is that the feeling itself, uh, the, the emotional experience of empathy in and of itself, perhaps it's useful, but what Steve is saying and what I'm saying is that there are many things involved with fixing a problem besides your feeling of compassion and folding those other things in can be helpful. Um, and Steve is kind of talking about that and kind of talking about something else. Um, and the same thing with openness, which he just mentioned in passing, but, you know, we'll talk about openness at some point here. And it's the same thing. I'm forced to use a very standardized definition. We're way ahead of conservatives with regard to openness. And openness is a terrible word for what it is that we're open, what it is that we're ahead of them about, you know, and we can get into that some other time. But he's making a very good point that we're not open in a lot. Oh dear, he went away. <laughs> Just lost. God. Hopefully, we'll he'll jump back in. Elizabeth, did you want to say anything? Just in response to what we've been hearing. Oh man, um, I'm taking it all in. It's interesting to me. Uh, sort of, what are the words that come up for me to think about more and the concept of safety and where do what level of safety does someone need to feel and about what things in order to engage with such different approaches if even the words we're using are ready for you know an hour of wait a minute what are we talking about um then it makes it hard to Imagine having another hour of conversation about, okay, we've defined this word, now what's the next one, now what's the next one? Um, so, so that's my, my first response is that it seems to me easier to talk across different perspectives when I've got some other shared understanding with someone, some personal connection, mm -hmm. than we've all joined into the same computer screen with each other and we have to be so purposeful on purpose about how we're making those connections, but seeing a bit of the fatigue of it all that I know we all feel. And it's important to move through that, but is that the most productive way for me to keep moving forward? Is sort of the word by word, where are you, where am I? Okay, where are you, where am I? Is that creating connections or is that just creating understanding? Well, Scott isn't on the call. Um, oh, he just, did he pop back in? Oh, there you are. Hi, Scott. I was just going to uh, add a plug for your, your book. I haven't completely read his book, but I'm loving it because I finally got to a place where I, I, I just love it. It's, and one of the things that he suggests strongly is what you just said, Elizabeth, which is, you know, one of the best ways to have these kinds of conversations is just hang out with conservatives so that you do develop the relationship and then slowly move into unpacking some of these, these concepts much easier when you know someone personally. So Scott, you were saying, you jumped off. Oh, well, I was, I was done with my first point, which is really just a, a sort of semantical 
thing. I just wanted to clarify because it, be, it can be confusing. You listen to Steve and, you know, he sounds like maybe he's contradicting me. But, but we've, like I say, we've been around and around this and we pretty much agree. It was a delight to hear that stuff that he said. The other thing I want to mention was, was I, I skipped over boundaries and I didn't mean to. Um, I just wanted to be clear, especially for Nancy. Um, conservatives are high in another trait called orderliness. I don't think Steve had any complaints with the definition of that one, thank goodness. But, um, but that one's also very, a very specific definition that may not be exactly what people think it is. But the primary way that we create order in life is establishing boundaries, clear boundaries between all kinds of things, up and down, so hierarchies, and also, you know, this way. And it's not just that you create boundaries, but it's also how thick those boundaries are and how definite they are. And I want to just give you an example right now of the relatively strong conservative movement that's going on now with regard to nationalism, right? Um, America first. America first is a boundary statement. And there are all kinds of really, really good reasons to have boundaries in life, of course. Um, and we need to understand that one of the major differences that plays into empathy really closely is that you, if you have strong boundaries like America first, it means that you are going to empathize and take care of people within boundaries before you take care of people outside of boundaries. So just on that very, very simple basis, to take a simple example, you know, liberals start talking about problems that are occurring in Darfur, and you can almost immediately get a glazing that happens just as a result of that. Um, and it has to do with this, this sort of boundary orientation. So self, family, neighborhood, community, region, state, country. Maybe we get out to global somewhere over the rainbow 400 years from now. But, but it's these boundaries that play out in, and they play integrally into empathy, mostly in terms of who you're empathizing with. Um, that's how boundaries play in there. And then the boundaries are a very deep concept. Um, I don't think we, we talk about it enough. There's a, there's a good uh, psychological theory around it that provides some really nice insights, and I use that and go over it in some detail in the book. Thank you. That's that was enough, Nancy. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. Is there a way for me to up upload this Word file, or should I just email it to you, uh, Eleanor, and then you, can, oh, Linda, and then you can um, send it. Uh, if you uh, if you send it to me, I will promise to put it on the Kiko Chat site so we can all uh, we can all access it. So, um, Bentley, did you have something you'd like to say? Uh, it just sounds like really good conversation. I think that really helped me understand the differences. Um, I, I believe that language is so important. So understanding the differences between, um, com you know, compassion or, oh, sorry, empathy and, um, and, <clears throat> and finding finding the right language. And I really, really believe in speaking in the language of a listener. Um, so that, that is one of the things that I really wanted to, to learn. So it gave me some really deep things to think about. And I really liked hearing that, you know, it's funny because I always considered myself the person that the big picture person. Um, and then when you talk about how the conservatives are uh, in general have been thinking about the big picture, it, it made me question how have I been thinking about the big picture? <laughs> what are my blind spots in that? Um, so that, that'll be really interesting to think through. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have anything to add to the conversation, but I got a lot of value out of it. So thank you. Nancy. Um, couple of thoughts. One, Elizabeth, I wanted to, was thinking about what you were saying and what came up for me was it isn't perhaps so much a matter of taking it word by word a word this resonant go and we go this deep 
opens up a whole lot of understanding. And it's like almost any any way into the understanding. But as you said, it increases our understanding. Does it yet increase our sense of connection? That's probably more relating on a number of different levels. I don't think it has to be word by word. And I'm also thinking that one of my quest, sets of questions is around how do we, what words do we use so that we're more likely to hear each other? Um, but a second is given as we hear each other, we discover these connections and commonalities. What does that allow us to start uh, exploring or doing together or trusting each other? And that in turn brings us to practical questions, if you will, political questions of where is there enough agreement that we can actually act together versus finding that there will be some places which might or might not fall along political lines where people differ, pe people of equal compassion and rationality nonetheless differ on what's the best thing to do in a given situation. And how do we deal with that? The other thing I'd like to address is the big picture question um, that Bentley was, Bentley, Bentley, your first or last name? Uh, it's my first name. I have two last names, so yeah. Okay. I do too, as it happens. So, <laughs> um, so this was what was coming up for me. If I'm, let's say that I'm embracing almost everything that I have heard both Scott, not quite everything Scott says. I have more problems with that. Not what you're saying personally, Scott. I just, I'm a philosopher. Ad hominem arguments drive me up a wall. Whenever we start looking at who's saying it and why they're saying it as opposed to the substance of what they're saying, I get a little uncomfortable, but that's just a disposition of mine. But I was found, mostly I was finding it just a really helpful way of understanding things, what both of you were saying. Then I find myself going beyond that or out of it or different from it in two ways. One, it seems to me for millennia now, one of the oldest means by which those in power stay in power is divide and conquer. You get people seeing each other as the other and fighting each other, and thereby those, um, those who are benefiting from a system that isn't working well for all, stay in, they continue to gain those benefits because people are fighting each other. So I'm very cautious about that. And part of what I'm looking for is a way of achieving greater solidarity. And I'll point to both of you, in particular, perhaps to you, Steve, to, uh, and I can send this information, to look closely, for example, at what's happening in Cleveland and the movement of um, worker, kind of blue collar workers taking over businesses and working with their communities to make communities that are healthier and that function better economically, and then looking for the kinds of structures that support that. Which takes me then to, I'm not sure how I identify politically, except that in one sense, I'm not a liberal, I think I'm a radical. But by a radical, I don't necessarily mean um, some of the things that are meant by that. What I mean is part of what is creating problems for communities and for individuals, for our society, for our planet, is that at a systems level, there's some major redesign that needs to occur redesign that better reflects our shared compassion and understanding. So I move then even further upstream and say, well, what's, what's happening systemically that's creating the problems? And is there anything that it's in our power to do to modify those systems, to find ways of fundamentally changing how we do, for example, our economics or our governance so that the results end up being much healthier for everyone in, involved and feeling that part of the 
my life's experience is if you put people in a dysfunctional situation, a battleground, a job, a family, a community that is really not working, that's got all kinds of inherent contradictions, scarcities, pathologies, we revert to our worst selves. We fight each other and we see each other as the problem because it doesn't bring out the best in us. If we flip the question and say, what are the conditions that do in fact bring out the best in us, which is what I saw your story about the Wisconsin community. Here is an environment that tends to bring out the best in us. And we say, okay, how do you create systems or structures that then produce those sorts of conditions that bring out the best in us and we can now start working together to develop and maintain those healthier conditions. Those ways of thinking I find powerful. They lead to interesting political strategies and potentially not just building bridges, but potentially really coming back together in a whole, whole, whole and wholesome way to solve our shared problems. So I, I would love to get um, your, any of your thoughts or responses to that if I'm even making any sense. I'm done, thanks. Well, how I heard you, Nancy, was that I think Republicans and, and Democrats have different ways of addressing what you just brought up and, and there, there li lies in possibly the problem. If we would both, if we could somehow bring, I mean, and I do want to leave some time to talk about this, if we could somehow bring in a conversation with people from both sides, it would be very right. But the way our little bubbles work is we have our, you know, our, our federal bubbles trying to work that out. And then we have our, our state and our community bubbles. And I, I actually think one reason that we're so split on this is that we're coming at it from such different places. I mean, I think, I think the liberal elite would want to use the federal, you know, mechanisms, right, to, um, to possibly create conditions that they would want to then implement. Whereas I, from what I've been reading, I've been trying to read things like, um, oh, that stranger from our own land book that was recommended here, I think in, as early as December. I mean, I'm really getting that, and please jump in, Steve, if I'm all off on this, that from a conservative point of view, you don't want to have federal solutions. You want to, have, you want to allow the church and the family and the, the, the community itself to um, uh, address issues, right? Linda, right. Linda I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I really feel, since you were picking up on what I was saying, that I really want to take it somewhere else. Let's say we look at Cleveland. Most of the things that are working in the world that I'm talking about, the systemic change changes, are grassroots up. They're ground up. Ordinary people figuring out how to solve the problems. And I think if we started with those stories, if we, for example, said, okay, let's look, what are they doing in Cleveland? Step back from the political labeling. Step back from the posturing and say, yeah, maybe the federal government is doing a lot of things to get in the way of that. I agree. And maybe there are some different ways of designing what goes on even in D.C. that will make it easier at the local level to do these things. So that's a, that is a federal question, but it's a federal question about enabling and making it easier to do problem solving locally, not the other, not having the government step in and do it instead. But what I'm really suggesting is if, for example, we didn't start with how can we who come at this from different perspectives understand each other, but rather how can we from different perspectives look at this exciting story, this solution of what seems to be working and see what that brings up for us and where we might go with that and get out of the predefined conflicts altogether. That's kind of where I want to go with that. And now step back. So maybe that's a Steve question. I don't know. Unmute yourself, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Nancy's right. <laughs> I mean, to cut to the to cut to the chase. And I also, 
can identify with what Elizabeth said about the words. Um, so let me go back to Nancy. What she said about dividing and conquering reminded me of a passage, and I can, I've copied this from, I've copied and pasted it from a book, so I can put this into a word file and send it to. It's a section called The Narcissism of Small Differences, and it's from a book by Adam Grant called Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World. And it goes into exactly that sort of thing um, that, that Nancy was talking about. My only point, or my main point to, to bring that up is that I see it as less of a way that the powerful, uh, a tool that the powerful use to keep power, and more of just part of how we're wired of, as humans. Um, and I also, along those same lines, understand what Elizabeth's saying is, is about the words, which goes back to my recommendation, my recommended solution for all of this is better education in K-12 schools. If just, if for one small example, if say, by the time students graduate from high school, they understand that what Elizabeth, uh, what Nancy was talking about, about the narcissism of small differences, is just one of those things that we humans do that is not really something that they do, whether you're on the left or the right, pointing to the other side. It's just something, something that we do. And this is what I started off saying from the very beginning. I think a lot of the um, partisan divide and a lot of the anger that flows back and forth across it is because we just have a very poor understanding of how we operate as, as, as human animals. And if we just had a better understanding of that, that itself would be a better common ground uh, upon which to have conversations. We would recognize the narcissism of small differences when it's happening. You know, we would recognize that, um, you know, maybe my, my uh, confirmation bias is kicking in right here or something. I think that's, <clears throat> You know, if I could have a magic wand or if I were king for a day, that, that's how I would do it. That's how I would approach it. It's a long-term thing. Right? And going back to Jonathan Haidt and the rider and the elephant, an elephant can't be convinced with an argument, with a logical argument, but it can be trained over a long period of time. Um, that's the whole point of training, of music lessons, right, is to sort of assimilate this information or knowledge or skill or capability into your being so that the, it then becomes just part of your natural tool set okay uh, but and that's what i would like to see us happening so you know my solution here is two or three generations away right if we, even if we were to be able to do it but that's kind of how i see this uh, uh playing out or i would like to see this play out and it would address the kinds of things that Nancy says, and it would address the kinds of things that Elizabeth said. It would give us more of that common language with which to communicate and connect. Instead of just assume that, you know, our way is the right way, and therefore they don't think straight. So does it mean more dialogues on, on uh, maybe trigger words like what we started to do here? Are you suggesting that? It uh, looks like, uh, I have an answer for that. It looks like Nancy wanted to ask a question. Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, am I right? Nancy, did Stephen, you did you, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Did, did you just say that you had an answer to that, but wanted to defer to me? Yes. yes. Um, well, let, let me, I'd like to hear your answer, and then I'd like a chance to comment just a bit, if I'm not preempting someone else well it's so so my answer is not so cut and dried as that um three basic things that i would like everyone to know to just be able to recite off the top of their head are the three principles of moral psychology from the righteous mind okay the first is intuition comes first and reasoning follows 
and you know that's been mentioned here. The right. second is uh, there's more to morality than care and fairness. Um, you know, and the third is morality binds and blinds. And where, in age-appropriate ways, uh, I would like to see those sorts of things reinforced through the entire K through 12 curriculum. One real simple little example: in elementary schools, teachers use their uh, cork bulletin boards to to use construction paper and cut out messages about. Um, uh, civics, civics responsibility, how to, how to be a good citizen. By the end of the year, as we cycle through the different uh, messages that the teachers put up, let's try to make sure that all the moral foundations are supported, are mentioned, are referenced at some point during the course of the year, not just the liberal ones. And in that way, help people understand um, that second principle sort of intuitively uh, of that there's more to morality than care and fairness. Then later on, where it's appropriate, um, my understanding is uh, children don't, abstract thought doesn't start to click in until around puberty. So, but the reading materials, the materials that teachers read to the, to the preschoolers, the stories that they hear, let's have those reinforce all the moral foundations by the end of the year. The reading materials that are signed in high school, maybe we do a homework assignment that says, um, which moral foundations do you think drove this character? Or what was the main um, um, ideology behind that motivated the story, that sort of thing. Without taking sides, without saying one's better than the other, without, just to expand the moral repertoire, so to speak, so that, so that we have more empathy toward and with each other, so, so that we're not so quick to just knee jerk if someone says something different that they're evil. Right. We can say, oh, I see, you're, you're kind of hooked into the, uh, the authority foundation there or whatever, you know, so that, that sort of thing I would like to see. So is there anybody who has anything that wants to follow? I, I would like to kind of shift to this idea of how do we... Uh, Linda, I really would like to follow up, as I had said before, Go ahead. Um, in a couple of ways. First, I wanted to go back to your earlier comment about divide and conquer. And, and let me be clear. I'm absolutely clear that our native makeup, our DNA, makes us extremely vulnerable. To that kind of divisiveness and i wasn't meaning to suggest those in power cause it in us but they can frame it in a way that serves their interest is all that i meant there going to your point of myself my undergraduate work was in anthropology and sociology with this enormous interest and in a lot of experience as a bureaucrat but my doctorate was actually on in philosophy of education was actually on distinguishing indoctrination from education. And the reason I was attracted to the topic to this day is that I feel the purpose of schools, including higher education, I define higher education as that which elicits, enables, and empowers our higher purposes. That's what it needs to be doing. That flows back into K through 12. How do you do that in a way that is not, quote, indoctrination, but is generally open, genuinely opening people up? And to what you have said, I would absolutely say it is absolutely fundamental, except I would even start with higher education because that's where the ideas and the teacher training and all that other stuff occurs. And I would say that along with the principles are the skills and practices, so that from mm -hmm. the very beginning, there are skills, we're practicing them today, in learning to listen, to treating each other with courtesy and respect, learning from each other, etc. So I'm just very excited by what you're saying. And with that, Linda, I will let you go back to trying to facilitate this. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to have a few minutes, because we're, we're wrap, almost time to wrap up, to um, address how do we um, create an environment that would be motivational to bring conservatives in? And 
Uh, Steve, you said something to me over the weekend that really stood out, um, which was how do we um, put the maybe, how do we even define what we're trying to do in terms that would evoke people to come? And you had said, and let me see if I can get it right, to do, do it in some way that says, uh, come to this dialogue so that um, the conservative perspective can be more understood? Was, wasn't that kind of what you said? Uh, yeah. It, I'm grasping as, as much as you are with a clear, distinct hook that we all go, aha, that's it, that we'll get conservatives in. But I touched on it in my long diatribe tonight, which... I'm pretty sure that'll be the longest one you'll ever hear from me because that kind of frames everything else around which I hang on my ideas. Um, but it was, you know, like I said, the feeling as a conservative is that it's always an uphill battle. I'm coming in, uh, you know, guilty until proven innocent. And so if you flip that and start out with saying, okay, we know we don't understand you guys, please come in and tell us what we don't get. Right. Um, and, and, and sort of flip the story. And, and instead of even setting a dialogue, say, uh, make it a listening thing. In other words, we liberals will listen and we, we really want to feel, um, we really want you to tell us about yourselves, right? What is it, right. We liberals want to know what it is about you that you think we don't understand or get wrong. Right. Um, I think that might get more folks in, like one or two instead of none. Right. Um, but I, it is a hard thing. I, I'm not sure there is a, a an, an easy, you know, giveaway NASCAR tickets. I mean, wh <laughs> what else can you do? I don't know. I may send something out to all of us since we've kind of participated on this dialogue uh, to see if I can phrase it right. You had something, um, Elizabeth? Yeah, I, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, Stephen's opening message of the Patriots win. Um, congratulations to you. And I guess what strikes me is I would be really interested in a, a dialogue that said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna talk about sports and we're gonna bring our political lenses in. Give us something to talk about that is a shared experience. And then how do we apply it? Um, because I have been in enough conversations and know enough conversations where it is either a liberal viewpoint saying, we don't wanna hear conservatives or please conservatives tell us what you think or vice versa of um, how do we bring in other pieces. But I. I would be excited by a conversation about some shared experience because there are um, maybe not pop culture because I take Stephen's point strongly that that has a skew to it as everything does. Um, but what are the daily lived experiences we have that, sh that we share as a starting point and then let's step back and ask some questions instead of jumping immediately to hey, let's get to these big definitional things that I think can be hard for us to move forward around and assume that we don't have places of connection. Um, NASCAR, right? I watch that car go around in a circle just like someone who believes something different than me does. Um, so starting with something else, knowing that we're gonna pay attention to political beliefs. I don't know if it would get more conservatives to the circle, but. I, I, I would be optimistic. Thank you. I think it's terrific as a metaphor for the things. As a Boston fan, I would say that would be great as long as you don't invite any Yankees fans. <laughs> All right, so I say that as a joke to make the point. We are tribal, and I think that's a great door in toward showing each other that, well, we do the same things in politics, except we don't even really see that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, Nancy. I'll get to you in a minute, Bentley. Nancy, you're on uh, mute. I, I wanted to start with building on what you were saying, Elizabeth, and more, even more generally, 
if you've ever been in a situation where you were invited to come into a socializing, a social experience or dating experience or whatever, and it was come get to know the other person, period. That is one of the most unsettling and off-putting and uncomfortable things where you're just going to go in and immediately focus on relationships, conversation, am I good enough? Did I say the right thing? If instead, as you said, there's a shared, you're actually sharing the experience or you're reflecting on shared experiences or you have a common task, common problem you care about, you're trying to solve, we're trying to get our neighborhood together, et cetera, reaching, as you said, into whether it's soccer moms or uh, faith communities or whatever, where people have natural shared interests. And then the second thing that I'm really working on here that I strongly believe, in many cases, I live in a, not only a community that is a quote progressive, but incredibly self-righteous, arrogant, ignorant, condescending, and it's driven me crazy. And so what I've done, and it's worked so far, is I've said, you know what, before we invite in the other, we need to deal with our own shit. So let's spend some time reading about the other, listening to the kinds of things, for example, that um, Steve and Scott were saying today, getting into our own tribalism, getting into the fact we don't always agree with each other. And even inside, we may not agree with ourselves. These are, if the questions are difficult, the answers aren't easy, then our tendency is to want to oversimplify. We've got our own internal conflicts, so let's put them outside and make the other, the bad guy. Process that kind of stuff. And prepare for being part of a larger whole. For example, I used to, I was, I put together a training on this and I said, spend a week with your car radio tuned to a conservative radio station or a Christian religious station and listen for how many things you can agree with. Even if maybe you wouldn't agree with the language, you can listen below it and you can hear something you can resonate with. So th those would be the two things I'd say. One is prepare ourselves, uh, us, if I'm saying I'm a liberal or whoever we are, they're reaching out to the other. And secondly, to, as Elizabeth was suggesting, find just really human places to be together first and then see what grows out of that. Hey, uh, I really like that. Uh, and to Nancy's point, I don't know if, uh, if Stephen or if anyone has any other sources of um, conservative or uh, sources that would maybe not quite be as... <coughs> hard to listen to when you're coming from a from a pre-programmed liberal perspective uh, i would like to to see what those are because sometimes i do dial in fox news and i find it challenging um and then also if we want to to talk about how um messages that may work i think if we come up with uh, there are ways to test this uh in the startup um uh, methodology when you want to test a hypothesis you um, actually buy some AdWords and you put up several a B test landing pages and put your verbiage and, and just have people sign up with their email address if they're interested in participation now you can easily attract the wrong type of people uh, um, like if you said you know come and tell liberals off um, you'd probably get a lot of signatures but they may not be the right people but it's the beginning of a test to kind of test your language and I'm happy to uh, set that up if you want. Nice. Nice. Um, so I'm noticing we've just got five minutes. Um, I wouldn't mind if any of you can stay on for just a little bit um, after we do a, a kind of a round um, just to talk about next time. That, that would be great. And I, I really appreciated what you said, Bentley. So why don't we um, just take a, a few seconds and just anything you'd like to say in terms of any ahas from tonight Anything you'd like to see next time? Um, who would like to go? Me, me, me. All right, Steve, you're on. Um, yeah, I, I meant what I said about 
probably not talking that long anymore because tonight I just sort of framed my perspective about how the bubble itself is skewed and why. And it was important for me to go into the depth and take the time to do that Mike Romano story about the Milwaukee theme park because a lot of my perspective hangs on that. So I probably won't uh, be so long winded in the future. As far as Bentley's question about conservative sources to listen to, I'm, I'm not sure that there will be any uh, on the airwaves. You might have to go to books. And one is this one. You can't see it because it's reflecting. It's called Conservatism. It's uh, by Jerry Z. Mueller, M-U-L-L-E-R. Okay. And of uh, particular interest is really just the first chapter first essay and before you go out and try to find the book and and buy it or, or whatever give me a little chance because i think i have it on a pdf and i can just send it with the things that i send to linda and, and great. You can see. um this is one of the books that john height mentions in the righteous mind when he had when he was 40 and he had to teach a course he went looking for information about conservatives and he saw this in the used bookstore and he sat down and he had one of his uh, epiphany moments of his lifetime of wow there is another way to see this and it's just the first chapter um and i i'd recommend that as a place to a reasonable place to start that probably won't set off uh too many bad vibes on on your side that's great yeah send me anything you have any of you any of you have any kind of resources uh if you send them to me i'll make sure i get them up on um kiko chat so who would like to just check out um Scott? i can just mention just to bentley um the national review is a good place to go to look to see articles um, you'll, you'll get a, you know, you, you go there 10 times, you'll get a sense of certain writers and, um, and you can generally handle them all. They're all hard, easier for you to deal with than Fox news. Um, one that's probably more acceptable or easier is uh, weekly standard. That's a, that's a good one to go to. You'll find, I don't know, a third of the articles you basically agree with everything they say, especially now with Trump because they, they got a thing about Trump on there. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to mention that <clears throat> there's a difference between listening to conservatives and trying to relate to them and understanding the science behind our differences. And we kind of conflated the two here. And I don't know if you sense that it's, it's a little awkward, but the reason why I wrote the Liberals Guide to Conservatives and I didn't write everybody's guide to everybody is because liberals have to talk about conservatives using their own language and using their own worldview to try and get their arms around what the hell these people are talking about. And that is a totally different conversation than having Steve say, talk about his stuff. And, and also Steve is, is even a bridge to what, what you really experience when you talk to conservatives because they're going to talk about political ideas. He's not talking about political ideas, right? And so my work is around trying to get you filtering correctly while they speak those political ideas, just so that you understand the context for the language that is bombarding and sometimes attacking you. You know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm at the place now where almost nothing a conservative says can feel like an attack. It's just, I've just done it too long. And, and so and, and the reason why is because I know the roots of personality. I know the roots of bias. I know the moral theories that are involved. And, and so we should all take the time to really understand the inherited fundamental differences that we have between ourselves so that we can engage in these conversations thoroughly and well. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Nancy, would you like to check out? I'll unmute you. On here. Oh, there we go. I said a lot, but this I just want to say this is and just really precious and valuable. And I particularly appreciate the amount of effort, uh, Steve and Scott, that you have put into this really deep, careful, uh, compassionate, <laughs> empathetic 
powerful, um, patriotic um, effort that has really, really given me a very solid basis for hope and appreciation all the more to you, Linda, of your capacity to make something like this happen. I'm, I'm feeling really blessed right now, so thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Elizabeth. I, what I'm chewing on, and I think I'll, it'll take me a couple of weeks to to digest, is what what happens, and this is sort of just Scott's point, that makes me move from I'm hearing something different to I'm hearing something that I need to judge as right or wrong. Um, and I think that right or wrong has an important function in my life as I make decisions and sort of the difference between knowledge and applying knowledge is coming up for me a lot. It's, I can practice the skill of listening to people who believe different things than me pretty well. I think that's a, a skill of mine. And then when we start talking about making decisions together, it becomes more challenging. And so what is what is that process that happens for me? When does it kick in that I go from, this person believes something different than I do, okay, to, huh, do I need to employ a sense of right and wrong? Because going back to that thing of safety, something about how I'm living my life is being threatened here. Um, maybe that's just how I think, or maybe that's how I live my life. So that's, that's where I'm chewing right now. Very cool. Bentley, would you have any last words? I just want to say thank you to everyone. It was very uh, informative and uh, look forward to working on it going forward with you. Cool. Yeah, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm just grateful that we've took, taken this next step. I feel like we're getting deeper and deeper into this subject and not sure exactly how to put a session together next time. <clears throat> um, it is our 6 three my time so um if any of you have a few minutes and you want to stay on that's cool otherwise i might i might even try to uh get some of us talking maybe in between because i would like some help in terms of both getting more conservatives on the call so do any of you absolutely have to go or do you have a few minutes to chat a bit you gotta go okay. i can stay okay if any of you can stay that would be yeah. awesome Otherwise, it's been wonderful, and uh, I can't wait till the next one. Excuse me. You asked an or question, and I'm not sure whether people were saying, no, I don't have to go, or no, I can't, I cannot stay. Oh, okay. okay. Well, if, who has to go right now? Okay, well, then we can all stay. Great. So I'm thinking <laughs> we have 10 minutes to just kind of talk about, you know, what might we do to get, I think there's two issues here. What might we do as a group to get more conservatives here? Um, one idea I have would be to just write something up and pass it by you all, especially you, Steve, the, the conservative, and um, possibly this other man who will probably join us next week. He's also conservative. He couldn't make it this time, but that would be one way. Or, Steve, you might even try your hand at writing something and pass it by us. I don't know. We can put it on the listserv. And then, Bentley, you said you had a way. I didn't quite understand how you could uh, help us maybe putting it on social media or something. Well, uh, I can do that, but also uh, we can we can test <clears throat> how people respond to it by uh, I can put it on a web page and then would buy traffic that's focused on people that tend to have uh, conservative views and just spend twenty five or a hundred bucks. I mean, I'd be happy to do that and then see how many people respond. It's just a standard way of testing a a message, uh, but. Um, so yeah, if we have a couple of ideas, I can I can see what I can do about that. Nancy. And I I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish up, Bentley. Oh, I was just gonna say I, I know some I do know several conservatives. I, I don't know if I'll have to think to see whether they would. Um. They're a little too combative. I don't know if they'd be ready for something like this. <laughs> so, what do they think about that? Nancy? Um, several things. First, the phrase I've been using in describing Steve, Stephen and talking to people in Santa Cruz is what I'm looking at are what I'm calling generous conservatives. Conservatives willing to hang out with liberals, put up with some of the bullshit from liberals, 
and really work with us to get go deeper and gain this kind of understanding. And it's a very, uh, it's a precious thing. And it may be that initially that's what we're also looking for. That's my first point. My second point is I would like to pick up on several questions and possibilities. The question that Elizabeth posed in my mind is when you make the shift from hearing each other and mutual understanding into now we have to try to do something together, make decisions together, agree on an action, what happens then? I think there are both some very, very good ways of thinking about that and some very good methodologies out there and some very good stories and examples of people doing that quite successfully. So it wouldn't, it would behoove us at some point to take a look at that. Thirdly, I will mention again, if we jointly look at something like the Cleveland experiment, I'll get you information about it so you'll know what I'm talking about. And if people with different perspectives were looking together at that so that Again, our different perspectives inform if they are looking not just at each other, but at something. <laughs> and we're, we're seeing different things in it. So we're gaining, going back to your question, Elizabeth, between understanding each other and making tough decisions. Often the tough decisions are tough because they raise lots of complicated questions. And if people with different perspectives can hear each other respectfully, we can then learn from each other all the things that we need to actually take into consideration in making the decisions, which has a tendency both to shift our initial positions and to elicit in us more creative problem solving. That's the basic dynamic of the successful processes. So I would like to look at the processes for doing that and maybe some examples and again i'll suggest the um cleveland experiment as a possible starting point and then my other point was that initially what we're looking for are conversations with people who have who identify as conservative or as conservative political perspectives but have the empathy and the commitment to actually sit down with us and help us reach deeper understandings. I'm done. So Nancy, is this um, Cleveland's, is it a fairly quick read? Can you send it to me? Is it something we can put up on Kiko chat? Yes, I, I can get you information about it. So what I'm thinking uh, is that we might incorporate that into our next session if people would be willing to read it. And even if they weren't, maybe one of us could just give a quick overview of it. And if we craft something that maybe Bentley you could test, um, or really any of us can test, I can put it out on the listserv. Um, maybe that's the way to go. Because then it's kind well, of- our, our, it brings our listserv. Our listserv is kind of a narrow listserv. I think we need to explore yeah. trying to get it out and some others. And I also want to say I would love it if we could spend a little time becoming more familiar with some of the processes that exist for helping people with differing political views use their differences to arrive at better solutions, not just trying to reach agreement, but improve, um, improve the quality of the solutions they're looking at. Maybe not next time, but that would be the other piece of it that I'd like to take on sometime. Yeah, that feels like it's down the line a little bit. <laughs> we're just trying to have a shared experience. And <laughs> but it kind of gets at what you were saying, um, Elizabeth, about having some sort of shared focus. So if we took Nancy's case in Cleveland, maybe we could get both sides. Does, does that seem to make sense to you and uh, Scott and Steve? If we had like a shared reading and then we kind of come at it from both a, how conservatives would look at it versus liberals, would that make sense? Not so uh, it, depend, it depends on the, the question, I would think. I think Bentley brings up an important point is that trying to find people who are not combative and interested in a fight uh, and but who are more interested in actually having a dialogue. That's why I say I'm a little bit preaching to the choir here because you guys are all listeners and 
want to have a discussion. It's it's hard to find not just conservatives, but conservatives or even liberals who want to do that. It's it's, it's a not easy. It's a selective process. I I agree, and I think you know it probably would behoove us to move outside of the NCDD world. So. Um, mm -hmm. Nancy, if you'll send that Cleveland case, uh, and Steve, please send all of the resources you mentioned. I know there's several things that I'm reading right now. I think I'll just put everything up on the listserv, or I don't mean the listserv, on um, the uh, Kiko chat under articles. So you'll be able to go there and see what some of us are reading and some of the resources that we're sharing. Um, I'll take a crack at coming up with some description that we might send out to other lists. Um, please, and then, you know, just get back to me. I'll send it to the uh, five of you since we are uh, having this conversation. And I might get the other guy that wasn't on the call today to um, look at it as well. He's a conservative. Um, does that sound like a pleasure? Elizabeth had her hand up. I, yep. I just want to reiterate, I, I would hope at some point we could think of a common topic that isn't political to begin with, um, because I, I do think that that's going, that is such a narrowing, mm -hmm. um, sort of to this point of listening and combative, that I'm going to be more primed to come in combative to something that is charged. Um, so if there is some other shared experience um, that we could think of for one of these dialogues, I think that that is a place, you know, it, uh, as someone who doesn't have kids, I know that if I talk to someone about their kids, we're going to have a longer conversation because that is a place that they can speak to and feel really comfortable and unthreatened by. Um, so I don't know the, the work in Cleveland. I, I'm sure it's interesting. And my guess is it's got some pieces of, of politics and policy to it. So um, it may not be talking about the Super Bowl, um, but but I would push us to think outside of the box of political topics as a way to get people in who the only way they can come to politics is combat. And so we're always going to keep, keep them out if that's where we start. Mm. Nancy? I'm totally in agreement with what you're saying, Elizabeth. And if I may suggest, it seems to me and let me put this out there to the group of you. It feels like there's sort of a two or even three step process we're involved in. I see the immediate focus of this group and others we might invite to it into it at this point as we have a shared challenge. We all care about improving communication across political differences. And conservatives that would come in, what I'm calling generous conservatives, and what um, Steve has been describing as liberals actually willing to listen, listening liberals <laughs> are not necessarily typical of the larger community, but we could come together first to understand each other and our motivations and language and so forth. And secondly, to keep exploring as Elizabeth and others have been raising, together try to figure out we have a shared problem. Our shared problem is if we care about improving communication across the chasm, and not just among people like us who care about that, we at least have that in common, but reaching out to other communities of people who are more, if you will, typically conservative or liberal in their inability to talk to each other, we're, we're together trying to figure out, well, how would we do that? So phase one is we're trying to understand each other and clarify this problem and what are the possible solutions. Then as we come up with ideas about how we might do it, then our phase two is let's design, if you will, some experiments that we could either do in our own communities or we could try to do it here in the Zoom environment where we test out some of our ideas. We test out what would bring people here, what would we focus on that would make it fun, interesting, and safe to talk with each other, and what would we talk with each other about, etc. That seems to me really important, but it, it feels more like trying to figure that out is the problem we share right now, and we're not quite there yet, but if together, together right now I mean 
the generous conservatives and the listening liberals could start coming up with some theories about how it would work, and Bentley can try out some language, then we could move into the very thing you're you're talking about, Elizabeth. I'm done. Okay. Well, I'm hearing. Uh, can I, yeah, can I jump in there? I, Jumping in on the same idea, I think Elizabeth's example of not necessarily Super Bowl, but just sports in general, is a great uh, segue into our basic tribalism. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be any particular sport even. We just know of examples of, of teams where there were great rivalries and the fans from the different cities literally get in fights with each other if you go to a game in the other uh in the other city so that's a great sort of metaphor to talk about our tribalism so what other aspects of basic human nature might might have similar metaphors what about compassion and empathy what about like is there a movie that we all like and we all fall apart over no matter which side we come from because we have this shared compassion or, or shared empathy. A, a, an idea that pops in my mind is book club, but I don't think I wanna make everybody go read books. But the idea is, is there something that's common that we can each bring our own perspective to, uh, like a book or a movie or a play or a song or, or, or something, I don't know, I'm just, Speaking out loud, grasping at straws, but I, I kind of like the, uh, the the idea that uh, Elizabeth has put out there. Personally, I can't do sports because I never watch sports. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't even know what to talk about. Um, if we had a book, if that's why I thought maybe Nancy's uh, "What Happened in uh, Cleveland" might do it. I, I I do. I like the idea of talking. Cleveland about is not a book. It's a short story or video. If it's even the right thing to do, it wouldn't demand what it would take to read a whole lot of stuff it's a it's a five minute or ten minute exposition of what they're doing there with some video language but it doesn't have what elizabeth is looking for the idea of some shared experience that we're working from well if there's some book some article something um, I, the thing that comes to my mind is Michael Moore's uh, Who Do We Invade Next? I thought, thought it was, I thought it was hysterical and it was probably, I don't know, did you see it, Steve? Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure if a conservative would even want to watch it. <laughs> You'd love it, Steve. Yeah, I bet I love Michael Moore. I know you love him, so. Yeah, no, I'm, no, Michael Moore is not at the top of my must-watch list. Not at the top of your list, no. Exactly. So I don't think we could bring in conservatives on that one. <laughs> now, there is another, but speaking of documentaries, have, has anyone seen the documentary called Can We Take a Joke? No. <laughs> no, what's it about? Um, that is, that's more up the conservative alley, so to speak. Let's, but That sounds good. But it's, um, it's a little more open to um, liberals, I would guess. I don't know, Scott, you and I watched it together. You might have a better feel of whether it even makes sense to talk about that. But still, I'm not sure it's exactly the kind of thing that Elizabeth is talking about. I mean, it is a movie, it's a documentary that everybody can watch, but it's not as resonant as the sports metaphor. So this, Oh, sorry, Steve, go ahead. Um, the thing that comes to me, and it may be completely wrong, um, but I think about those YouTube clips of soldiers coming home to their dogs. I think back to Steve's original point of like the things we cry about alone in the room, and maybe not everyone loves watching the videos of dogs and soldiers reuniting, but those sort of like get you emotionally pieces. Um, but there's a lot to unpack in how I experience watching a soldier come home that someone who believes something different than me wouldn't. But we both watch that dog and that soldier come together and it's like, oh, that dog is so happy. Um, so that's what I think about is like, what are those things that we have a similar 
initial emotional reaction to, um, this sort of goes to Scott's point of, uh, you know, what happens in the first millisecond and then what happens in the second. Um, so I'm not saying we should just watch dog and soldier videos, but that's an alternative that isn't sports of some sort of shared emotional experience that's short. And then wh what am I thinking about that makes that meaningful to me? Scott, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I was just thinking how um, the the idea that you that you did Elizabeth just now and sports that you, you could you could probably run through a whole bunch of these things that are uh, that are actually I mean there's the middle ground because ideology is is much much bigger than politics it it invades our life in all kinds of different ways and determines how we live and so you can talk about parenting um, you can talk about the military which most people think of as political, but I don't. Um, and you can think about sports. Um, sports conservatives are huge team sport fans relative to, to liberals, you know. And you could have a conversation about track and field. And so I, I guess what I'm saying is you could you could kind of run through a number of these things and in a somewhat organized and ordered way and see what happens that way. That's, that's a possibility. Marriage. Um, going to church, which again is almost political in some people's minds, but really shouldn't be. What do you think of this documentary, Can, Can We Take a Joke? Would that work, Scott, from a liberal? Uh, I don't remember it. Sorry, Steve. How long is it, Steve? I think it's maybe 75 minutes. It's not that long. It's What's it about? I don't remember. Comedians aren't going to college campuses anymore because they're afraid oh, to get. Right. Yeah, because they nothing is allowed to be said anymore. Yeah, yeah now there's a good example of of something where liberals are just going to learn something for seventy five minutes. You know, I mean, it's yeah, it's a basically an a mild instruction manual for liberals about conservatives, kind of like some of my work, but more more whiny about it, in my opinion. Would it give us good. enough? Yeah, okay. Would it give us enough to I chew think... on? To have a dialogue on? I mean, are there, are there yeah. about it? That... I mean, there, there are underlying themes there that I, that I think you can bring up and deal with explicitly, you know. Um, you know, it does deal with the, the, the uh, political correctness, you know, which is something that we should get around to dealing with somewhat formally here. Is this something you can yeah. send, or can, how would we find it, Steve? I, I'm really hesitant to go there for the reason, some of the reasons Scott is saying. I think we could, down the line, have some very helpful conversations about identity politics and the ways in which that has really lent itself to divisiveness right up to the present. But right at the moment, I want, I'm really drawn to Elizabeth's idea and trying to find a movie does a movie or a video, a movie we watch ahead of time or a video seems, if it's more like a story, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not saying we should do this, but what came up for me immediately, because I saw it recently, was Hacksaw Ridge. Now, Hacksaw Ridge is one of the bloodiest films you will ever see. So nobody that can not handle that can handle that movie. But as a statement of courage, patriotism, principle, um, heroism, positive view of the military in ways, and at the same time raising really deep questions um, from a Christian perspective and, and from a, a, if you will, liberal perspective. It's really quite profound. I don't, it wouldn't work because there are too many people who would be turned off by it. But I'm thinking if we could find a movie that was popular enough, let's say a blockbuster, so a lot of people were watching it and be looking for one that was really turning on or resonating or, or triggering emotions from different sides of our political ideologies and cultures, and maybe raising some of these important values questions, but not in a real simple black and white kind of way, you know, raising, if you will, some of the moral complexities, that something like that could be a shared experience. It's also the gender issue. I mean, I think one of the difficulties 
with sports is that not not very many women are really into sports, at least not very many liberal women. I don't know about conservative women who may or may not be into it. And I loved when I lived in Boston going to the Red Sox games. Um, but anyhow, I I I want to I really want to explore something that is not upfront raising questions along our political divide yet. I'd rather experiment with the sort of thing Elizabeth is talking about. Can we find a shared human experience that is deep enough emotionally and then see where that takes us? But I don't know why people will come to such a phone call. They've got maybe better things to do with their time. So that's the other mm. question I have. Well, we're going to have to go. I've got to go. <laughs> this has been a fabulous conversation. <laughs> Um, if any of you have ideas, send them to me. <laughs> um, and I may call a few of you, I may email a few of you, and somehow we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I think we really... Thanks for all your facilitation of what is a winding conversation. Yes, it can, it's going to be ongoing for a long time. But I think we are right at the edge of what we really need to be doing. So it's good to, it's good to be on the journey with you all. So take care and I will be in touch.